Norway's diplomatic history from the mid-20th century onwards is marked by significant contributions to international peace and cooperation. A notable highlight is the appointment of Tryggve Lee as the first Secretary General of the United Nations in 1946. Lee, a Norwegian diplomat and politician, played a crucial role in establishing the UN's presence in the early years of the Cold War setting a precedent for Norway's active engagement in global affairs. Moving forward, Norway continued to leverage its reputation as a neutral, peace-loving nation to facilitate critical diplomatic efforts. This was exemplified by the nation's role in the Oslo Accords of 1993, further solidifying its reputation in international peace efforts. But can the spirit of this groundbreaking moment in the Palestine-Israel conflict be revived as the war on Gaza enters its fourth month? Norway maintains a stringent policy regarding arms exports, adhering to a principle of not selling weapons to countries involved in active armed conflict. But are Norwegian weapons sold to Israel by the United States being used in Gaza as well? These are some of the questions we put forward as the Norwegian Foreign Minister, Espen Bart Eide, talks to Al Jazeera. Espen Bart Eide, the Foreign Minister of Norway, thank you for speaking with Al Jazeera. Thank you for your interest. It's a pleasure to talk to you because Norway has a long history here at the United Nations. Uh, a lot of people maybe don't remember that the very first Secretary General Tryggve Lee was Norwegian. Also, there's the Oslo Accords, yeah. of course, uh, named after your capital city because the first secret talks 31 years ago mm -hmm. between the Palestinians and the Israelis took place initially in Oslo that led to the Accords. Here we are three decades later, and I want to talk to you about the two-state solution. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has just recently said, uh, that sovereignty does not align with Israel's post-war plans. He meant sovereignty for the Palestinians. Recent polls show that the majority of Israelis are uh, against a two-state solution. So has the door to a two-state solution, as envisioned in the Oslo Accords, officially closed? No. I don't think so. Quite on the contrary, I actually think that the opportunity is now for actually putting this back on the table. And I think that's what we will see happening from a lot of the interventions in the Security Council today. It's obviously a serious problem that the current Prime Minister of Israel is saying that he is not behind the two-state solution, although several Israeli governments have signed up to agreements which, where the logical outcome would be that one day there would be a two-state solution, meaning a uh, sovereign Palestinian state and a continued Israeli state that would live at peace with each other, uh, with agreement around issues like uh, border security, uh, the state of Jerusalem and the status of uh, refugees. And the idea, as you will remember, back in uh, 93, which is almost 31 years ago, is that while there were still outstanding issues on the way to actual full statehood, one could start building the institutions of a Palestinian state so that when these other questions were finally negotiated to a successful settlement, institutions were ready to take over. So we started uh, working together with uh, Norway, with many Arab states, uh, the EU, the US, Israel at the time, and the Palestinians, to build what is known as the PA, the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Institutions, which were supposed to be in charge of the West Bank as well as of Gaza uh, as one state, and, and that one would build bottom up. Uh, I think that was a very good approach. But of course, it's important to say that it was only meaningful as part of a process, because the goal was Palestinian statehood. I strongly believe then, and I believe today, that the Palestinians have a full right of having a state of their own, not only in theory, but also in reality on the ground, an actual state that controls the territory, that deals with the services of people, that is democratic, that has, people can make choices within a Palestinian state. The tragedy is, and, and this is long before 7 October and all that happened later, is that 
for many Palestinians, this started uh, to look like a false promise. Good idea, but a false promise because the state was not coming. Uh, for, many, for some Israelis, I think including the Netanyahu government, uh, governments in plural, this seemed like this was a settlement itself because there was a level of cooperation, at least with the West Bank authorities. And, uh, and there was relative peace and calm most of the time. Uh, so uh, the, the Oslo promise was not delivered on. If you had asked me a few years ago, I would probably have said that I think the time is up. But now I'm actually more convinced that there is no alternative to this. We have to get it back on the table, but that, in, that includes both sustained messaging to Israel that this is good not only for the world, but also for them. Because if you want to remain a Jewish state, Israel, and if you want to be a democratic state in the future as well, you need also to settle the Palestinian problem. And if you want those Palestinians who put their priority on building their economy and culture, uh, a good life for Palestinians, they also need to see a political horizon that can give them hope. But what do you do about settlements? The, the issue of settlements was supposed to be dealt with in the Oslo Accords. The last time that yeah. there were talks about this was 2014. It ended in failure. Mm. Uh, Israel has pushed even more settlements just within the last year, uh, as many as 3,000 more settlements at least. There are about 500,000 settlers just in the West Bank. Mm. How do you get to two-state solution given this obstacle? But these, I mean, to build settlements on occupied land is illegal. Uh, it is very clearly stated from several UN resolutions that that uh, should not be done. And in the final settlement, we also have to find a solution to that, obviously, because uh, you need to have congruent territory in a future Palestinian state. There's still room for negotiations, but there has to be you know, we don't want only a theoretical state that can be recognized uh, as a vision. We want an actual state on the ground. And I remain convinced that this is good. I mean, it's obviously good for the Palestinians, but I also think it's the best answer for the Israelis. Even if the current government in Israel does not say so, I think this is what could give Israel the opportunity to live in peace in the long run without having to have all these security incursions uh, all the time. You say the current government are you looking ahead to a post Netanyahu government? Do you think Netanyahu right now is an obstacle to a two state solution and an obstacle to peace? Well, I mean, I, I'm quoting Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu himself. Uh, himself, I've been saying repeatedly that he not, not does, does not believe in a two state solution. I think that can be qualified as an obstacle to a two-state solution. But states last longer than uh, governments, and I think, uh, as, as in every country, there could be new governments in the future. We work with the government of the day, of course, and we do have, we do work with them, uh, for instance, on the issue of uh, the transfer of money to the Palestinian authorities. Yeah, with the uh, ad hoc committee that you guys lead. And we, and we have for uh, now almost 31 years uh, been a chair of the so-called HALC, which means the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee. So it gives ad hoc a new meaning that you are ad hoc for uh, 31 years, of course, but we are still in charge of the Donor Committee for Palestine. And this is Norway's primary formal role and why we, even if we are distant to the Middle East, take such a strong uh, stance on this. We, the Oslo Accord started in Oslo and the HALC is the only institutional body where Israel and the Palestinians actually meet. Yeah, and that's the ad hoc liaison committee. Mm. And Norway has, has led that since its founding in 1993. Correct. And it's about transferring of funds to the Palestinian Authority. Yes, it's, it's to coordinate all those countries who have been willing to help the Palestinian authorities. I mean, there's, some, there's the Americans, it's yeah. the Europeans, it's ourselves, it's the Arab state, the Gulf states, a, a number of countries. And, and, and in order to make sure that this was coordinated yeah. and, and, and collaborative, uh, we set up this institution in which the PA, the Palestinian authorities to meet, the Israelis meet, and all the donors meet, and to channel the funds. Uh, but we're not only channeling the funds, we're also trying to be helpful in uh, giving uh, advice, friendly uh, advice, uh, for instance, to the PA about their need to modernize itself, to upgrade its sure. uh, capacities and so on. Just one last question about Oslo. If you could rewind the clock, if you would, and you could redo Oslo, knowing what you know today, 
What would you change about it? Yes, it's a very good question. And of course, we have been asking ourselves that exact question. I think we would be clearer on timelines. So, uh, there was too much of an open-ended uh, mandate. I think we would, should have said that uh, given that uh, we want to achieve X, Y, Z, if this does not happen, this will th happen anyway, you know, some kind of clarity. Because, you know, if you have this open-ended process, in a sense, you presuppose that all parties are constructive all the time. But, but you, there were some inbuilt mechanisms that could allow for those who wanted to either break the process or, or halt it, delay it, uh, to actually delay it. So that's uh, a lesson learned, I think, from, from the early Oslo days. Let's talk about the current crisis mm. in the Middle East. Your country and you yourself came out very early in this conflict, mm. uh, raising concerns about Israel's war on Gaza. Uh, it was late October. Norway uh, was the only Nordic country to vote in favor of the General Assembly resolution calling uh, for a humanitarian truce. You yourself in late October came out and said that Israel's bombardment of Gaza was, quote, going too far, end quote. Yes. I, Is I, this now a genocide? Uh, let, me, let me say that I, um, we were, it was a little lonely in the early days in our part of the world. I mean, what I said was very much in line with what most of the world was saying already, you know, most, most of the neighborhood and, and, and the global south. But in, the, in Europe, this was a more unique position. Now many more Europeans have come on board. Now all the Nord in later reserve, right. all the Nordics voted. So I'm, I'm glad we were early, and I'm glad others have uh, followed. What, what I said and what I still say is that, of course, we recognize that a state that has been subject to a terrible terrorist attack where 1,200 people were killed on the 7th of October by Hamas, of course, it has a, a right and probably you know, an obligation uh, to fight back against uh, the group that did that. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about that. But any use of force has to happen within the remit of international law. So the critique is not about whether Israel has the right to defend itself, but it, how it does it. And here I said, and I think evidence has proven this, that in many cases, the sum of what has happened, the, the, use, the use of weapons, the massive bombardment, the uh, de facto uh, blockade of, uh, of key uh, uh, you know, life support, uh, food, medicine, uh, and so on, uh, and now we're even seeing uh, starvation, uh, you know, we see malnutrition of kids, we're seeing uh, uh, a spread of infectious diseases. It's really a terrible place, as the humanitarian community can tell us and do tell us. This is, goes way, way beyond what is legitimate as self-defense. So what is it then? Do you, do you see evidence of a genocide, like so, many you know, experts are saying? Well, I think that we have seen uh, excessive use of force, uh, not in line with the international humanitarian law. But I continue to work towards a ceasefire, hopefully an immediate and lasting ceasefire, uh, a, a rapid step of, of humanitarian support and the restart of a political process. Norway uh, does not allow weapons made in Norway to be used in war, mm. exported to countries in the middle of war. That's been a long-standing mm. tradition in Norway since 1959. Correct. However, sir, there's a loophole, mm. and Norway weapons makers can send weapons to the United States, for example, that then send them to Israel. There's also Norwegian arms makers that have offices in the United States, as you well know, because you were a uh, defense minister That's for correct. a while. Mm. There's a loophole there, and, it, and we're seeing Norwegian weapons th going to Israel in this current conflict through this loophole. Will you commit to try to close that and, and institute some sort of end-user uh, auditing system so that doesn't happen anymore? So, uh, first, it is very clear that uh, anything that is built in Norway or where the primary part of a weapon, even if it's built somewhere else, uh, is Norwegian, cannot be exported. That's very clear in our laws. Mm -hmm. It's also true that we have Norwegian-owned weapons production, for instance, in this country, in the U.S., we don't know, I am not aware of any case where they have produced a weapon and sold it to Israel. What, what is true is that weapons that were acquired by, for instance, the U.S. Army many years ago, at the later point, have been part of a donation to Israel. But no, but direct sales, uh, we, we have heard about it, we uh, looked into it, and we didn't find any cases. So we take these things seriously, of course, because we don't want to contribute to 
the war effort. Let's go to the Red Sea. Mm. Um, uh, in early December, the Houthis started attacking uh, some uh, tankers. And in early December, they actually hit a Norwegian tanker mm. that the Houthis said uh, was transporting crude oil to an Israeli terminal. Mm. Um, does Norway consider the U.S.-led uh, attacks on Yemen now as a legitimate response or an unnecessary escalation? Well, you know, we uh, the the Red Sea uh, is you have to go through the Red Sea to get to the Suez Canal, and if you can't use the Red Sea, it means that all transport have to go around the Cape, around Africa, and that will make a global trade uh, much more costly, much more difficult. So it's really one of the uh, key. Uh, infrastructures uh, of the global economic system is that you can actually sail through the Red Sea. So we have been taking part, or we are taking part in the military operation in the Red Sea to defend the ships there locally, not attack on land, but to, you know, to make defensive measures out at sea against the ships that are there. We have not taken part in the attacks on Houthi rebels led by the US and the UK, but we have expressed an understanding that you know, we cannot allow these attacks to go on. But we have at this, in the same moment said that we are also concerned about escalation and that we need to go back to the core issue, you know, the Israel-Palestine issue and the war in Gaza, because that seems to be the fuel that all these different groups are now playing on. So if we see expansion into the Red Sea via the Houthis, if you are seeing, you know, an escalation in, in, in Lebanon, uh, I would say God forbid, but if that happens, and, and in other parts of the region, this is a spin off of the Israel-Palestine question. And have, so we have to look at the local issue, but also its connection to the uh, deeper problem. And I think that if we manage to get the, you know, the, the Israel-Palestine issue back on track into something constructive, which might seem re really difficult now, but also really necessary now, that will also take away much of the fuel that these, I mean, the intellectual fuel or the political fuel that some of these actors use. And I, if I may also add that I'm, I'm, I'm a little sad for Yemen because after all these years of violent conflict, they were on their way to something. There were some kind of rapprochement between uh, the uh, internationally recognized governments and the Houthis that could have led to something, a more peaceful development. But now being drawn into this means that you may also undermine, uh, you know, the, 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 this very uh, carefully grafted road to stability in Yemen itself. And that, that is also a people that have been suffering a lot the last uh, decade. Yeah, you talked about Lebanon. Clearly there's risk of uh, spillover there. Yeah. Are, are you more worried about spillover in Lebanon or are you more worried about the escalation taking on the happening now in the Red Sea? I'm worried about both. They're two very different things. I mean, we have seen uh, way too many examples of how uh, the people of Lebanon and the country of Lebanon have been drawn into conflict, other people's conflicts, which are not necessarily generated in Lebanon, but we will very heavily affect them. It hasn't really happened yet. It seems that the, the different sides of this, the Hezbollah, and the Israelis have maintained sort of a relatively low level. I mean, there are exchanges of fire, but roughly within, within sort of the agreed rules of the game, if you may use such a word. But of course, when we saw the attack on the Hamas leader uh, in Beirut, uh, there was a deep worry that that would trigger an uh, even bigger escalation. Hasn't happened yet. That's not a guarantee that it will not happen in the coming weeks and months. There are a lot of people around the world that see um, a real double standard, mm. a double standard with the West on how they look at uh, the war in Ukraine and a double standard on how the West views the war on Gaza. Uh, it's very easy for European and other countries to call out war crimes that are allegedly happening in Ukraine, but a lot more hesitant to call out war crimes in Gaza. Do you see that double standard yourself and why is it there? So not, not only do I see that, but I've also called it out myself. I have said that this, I've said from an early point, by the way, that let's make sure that we treat similar cases similarly. Uh, now, of course, uh, let me first say there's a big difference between how these two conflicts started, because in Ukraine, it was an attack by Russia on Ukraine. So Ukraine was the victim who responded to an attack. 
uh, if you look at this particular chapter of the long Middle East story, there was a Hamas attack on Israel and Israel responded. So in that sense, it's not compatible. But regardless of how the conflict started, every uh, party to a conflict and particularly every state who has signed in a set of international agreements are obliged to use force in a manner which is compatible with the key principles of international humanitarian law. And what do they say? They principally say you shall take strong measures to reduce civilian suffering uh, as much as possible. That means both directly from military hits but also from secondary consequences. And you need to distinguish clearly between uh, b between uh, military and civilian goals or fighters and civilian goals and this is why I, what I think has been violated in Ukraine by Russia but also in Gaza by uh, Israel and I've said that and one of the many reasons I say that is that I think the last thing we want is the perception of double standards and I have to say I understand that in uh, large parts of the Arab world and in the global south there is uh, a perception that uh, the West treats these cases uh, too differently and I have to say I can understand that and that will not, that is not conducive uh, to a, a better global understanding and we need to understand each other in order to make sure that these rules are applied also in the future because these norms, they are written in important documents in the, in the UN Charter, in the Geneva Conventions but, but their actual clout, their actual power lies in whether they are uphold or not. And if you do not uphold them, you are also undermining them for the next time around. The EU, the US and the UK all classify Hamas as a terrorist organization. Your country, Norway, does not. In fact, Norway has pretty regular contacts with Hamas political leadership, including after October 7th, I believe. Why uh, does Norway have uh, contacts with Hamas. Why is it important for your country? I, I would like to use the word channels to Hamas, but I, I know what you mean. Uh, well, it has been, you know, one of the part, one of the diplomatic uh, uh, key elements of Norwegian diplomacy is that whenever possible, we try to speak to everyone. Uh, and if you want peace, you sometimes have to speak to people who disagree with the other, but also disagree deeply with you. Uh, it doesn't mean that that is limitless, uh, but it is, uh, uh, you know, some people have to try to be the honest broker, to try to, to convey messages. Uh, you know, Qatar has also been a state which we have been working closely with, which have done some of this. And I can tell you that also some of those countries that do not do this themselves are actually quite appreciative that some do, because sometimes you need these channels to be open. And we are, we are very careful about these terror listings. Uh, we will, of course, obey with everything that's decided in the Security Council. Needless to say, that's international law. Sometimes, but not always, we also associate ourselves with the EU lists. But as a general principle, we try to be, in principle, available for speaking to all sides. And there are a number of cases in history where that has been quite useful and where people have thanked us later even if they were not so enthusiastic when it was going on. And these channels remain open after October 7th? They, the channels remain open. No apologies for that. Uh, we were very clear uh, that uh, what was done by Hamas was a terrible, uh, you know, a, a terrible terrorist attack and we have condemned the terror attack. Uh, terrorism is terrorism and, and should never, you know, regardless of your motivation, it should never be accepted. But uh, we have still felt that, uh, you know, if you want to be helpful on the hostages, if you want to be helpful on, the, on the ceasefire, if you, if you want to help look for solutions that can make life better for real, really innocent people like all the children in Gaza, some kind of channels are warranted and, and I do not feel I need to apologize for that. Peace is a good thing. Uh, we're here in the United Nations. Uh, as we've discussed during this interview, Norway has a long history at the United Nations on many different levels and a long history of engaging on the Palestinian issue. So when can we expect that Norway will begin advocating for Palestine to become a full member of the United Nations? We have long ago recognized the right of Palestinians to have their own state, but we don't want this only to be a symbolic gesture. We want a real state on the ground. So we want to connect the work towards our own recognition, together with hopefully together with other Europeans, uh, with enhancing their status at the UN, 
to a process that also leads to the reality of a state. And I will be very happy on the day, I hope it will be under my tenure as foreign minister, that we can actually see both of these happening because the solution to the essential, the quintessential problem of the Middle East is that we need a Palestinian state to live peacefully side by side by Israel and the, and the positive synergies that that will create for the region itself, regional peace, normalization of relations with other Arab states is incredibly important, not only for people in the Middle East, but for the entire world. So we'll keep working on it until we're there. Espen Bart Eide, the Foreign Minister of Norway, thank you very much for speaking to Al Jazeera. It was a pleasure to meet you.